um, I'm talking about dignity conserving care and I asked to go last today, uh, partially because I felt like uh, you needed some, you would probably need some encouragement at the end of a day like this when you see how far uh, the mighty have fallen in terms of Canada being a place of, of support and compassion and that there are things that you can do. And I want you to go away with that. So um, I, all, I have a disclaimer slide that's my Anne of Green Gables disclaimer, which where Anne said, although I say far too much, if you only knew how many things I want to say and don't, you'd give me some credit for it. So I'm hoping that you'll just focus on a few things about dignity conserving care that stand out for you. And think of this as more of a smorgasbord that you can use in your own sphere of influence. Um, I have a picture of Dr. Harvey Max Chachinoff who um, is sort of the, the pioneer of dignity conserving care. And I, he's a personal friend of mine and trained me in dignity therapy. And I have his enthusiastic and explicit permission to uh, speak on these issues and to use his format. So he became interested in the concept of dignity in medicine way back in, in the 20th century when he realized that loss of dignity, that term, was almost always included in reasons given by patients who desire euthanasia. Um, the, the quick uh, differentiation, euthanasia is where someone pushes the syringe or does something to you, and assisted suicide is where you participate yourself. Um, I think it is a good idea to call it assisted suicide all across the, the board because opponents of, uh, uh, proponents of assisted suicide don't like the word suicide in there. They say it's not really a suicide, but it is. And um, interestingly, the government is really picky about this. We couldn't get continuing medical education credit for a conference that we were giving um, if we didn't use the term made. The, the, one of the psychiatrists had wanted to talk about uh, psychiatric reasons that people might choose euthanasia and they would not give CME credit for it unless we changed the terms. So controlling the language is always important. So what is dignity? This is a question when I speak with students, I get them to be a little more Socratic about it, but a simple definition, it, it's to be worthy of honor, respect, or esteem. And in Latin, dignitas means worthiness. So an important, a couple of important questions that we need to think about. Is dignity inherent or conferred? And can dignity be lost, quote unquote? So let's, we'll think about those things a little bit. So here are some of the aspects that I plan to cover. Um, I, I'm just gonna skip this because you'll never remember it in your head. So the, one of the, the, uh, the concepts I wanted to bring before you in palliative care is one of the foundational principles of palliative care is that of total pain. Dr. Cicely Saunders, who was the person who was the founder of modern palliative care, had four different aspects of, of total pain. There was physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. And these kind of overlap like a Venn diagram. Now in my slides, it's a pie chart because I haven't figured out how to do a Venn diagram, but they really do overlap. And um, another category that's not uh, spoken about by Dr. Saunders, but anybody who's ever been uh, had a, a serious illness in a hospital setting or outpatient setting knows that bureaucratic pain goes in there as well. And you have to wait for a procedure or wait for results or you, um, you can't get the care that you need. So th that's this idea of total pain. One of the cases that I have had that illustrated this the best was a young woman whom I'll name Jen. And we had a very hard time getting her physical pain under control. She had a bad gynecological cancer. And finally, she confessed to someone that she felt in her own words, that she was suffering as a result of having a quote unquote promiscuous lifestyle and that God had cursed her. 
We um, got her pastor to come and speak to her. We talked to her about the nature of God and we were able to get her pain under better control, but it still wasn't completely controlled. And one day I went into her and said, you know, Jen, it seems to me there's something else going on here. There's something else that, me, that where you're not getting your pain controlled. And she said, do you really want to know? And I said, yes, I really want to know. And she said, well, I'm just worried that when I die, nobody is going to be able to cash in my Club Z points. Now, Club Z was uh, the rewards points from a now defunct store called Zellers. And so this was a long time ago. And I just looked at her and said, your Club Z points? And she said, yes, I've been saving for two years to get a bicycle for my little boy. And I'm just afraid that after I die, he won't get his bike because nobody will be able to use my points. Well, we got some money out of the, we used her points and we got some money from the palliative care foundation. And that little guy was riding his bicycle up and down the hallway the next day. And we got Jen's pain under control, fully under control in with half the pain medication that she was on before, because all of those aspects, the physical, the psychological, the social and the spiritual aspects of the pain that she had been experiencing were addressed. So there are major dignity categories. Um, some of them are related to the illness and under the illness, things like the level of independence. So what's the patient's cognitive acuity? What's the functional capacity? How can you be, can you be independent? And then there's symptom distress, like physical distress and psychological distress. And the, the physical distress, I think everybody gets that one. So I'm going to skip over that, but it is very important just as it was for Jen. So symptom distress, a couple of, and Dr. Dr. Chachanov has some very good questions. So think about asking some of these questions if you're ever in a position like Dylan, where you are someone who is near a patient or near um, a, a family member or whatever. So if there's medical uncertainty, the questions that, uh, that Dr. Chachanov suggests are, is there anything further about your illness that you would like to know? Are you getting all the information you feel you need? So can we put the person at ease if they have just more information? If they have death anxiety, are there things about the later stages of your illness that you would like to discuss is a question he suggests. So are there some things that are really freaking this person out that might not even happen very often in, uh, in that particular diagnosis? So finding out what are some of the things related to the illness that might be giving them a hard time? Well, you can't see the beautiful picture of two of my granddaughters taking care of our dog when she had a surgery. But um, one of the dignity conserving perspectives is continuity of self. So am I still me? So asking the patient, are there things about you that this disease does not affect? So one of the things that we find for our patients is the importance of photos and stories of patients. So if family members can bring in photos or write a little story about the patient, this can be really important. One patient I took care of in Halifax, she and her husband had been champion ballroom dancers. And she had a, a cancer that was very wasting and she weighed about 85 pounds. But there was a photograph of her with her husband when they won a, a competition, you know, in one of their poses. And it made such a difference as to how we saw her because we could see her more as a whole person. So, uh, another one is role preservation. So one of the stories I have about this is uh, also in Halifax, we had a gift cart where patients could choose something if there was a gift, uh, a, 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 an occasion for giving a gift coming up like Christmas or a birthday, and they could choose one of these donated gifts and give it to their loved one. And they, even when they couldn't go out to to purchase a gift. And I was just about to step into the room one day 
when one of our volunteers was about to wrap a present for one of our patients and the patient just exploded at this volunteer who was actually quite a famous opera singer but she came in and volunteered and the patient just said don't you have any idea about how to wrap a present properly you don't put the top down first you put it in from the sides first and i started to get really upset about this and i was about to march in and say don't talk to our volunteers like that because we're quite protective of them but the volunteer who was an artist herself understood what this meant to this patient this patient had been a beautiful painter visual artist and she had had she had she was left-handed and she had had her left arm amputated at the shoulder because of cancer and she it it she went into this fit about the present partly because it represented that she could not practice her art the way she would she had this artistic eye and the opera singer understood that i just kind of slunk away from there because i realized that the opera singer was way better at this than i was at that point um another thing is generativity or a legacy one of the most creative things that i saw a patient do at one point was that she she had granddaughters who were about seven and nine at the time and she went down to burke's jewelry store and she chose a birthday gift for each of them that burke's kept in their vault and sent out on the girls birthdays until they were 21. so she, they got a present from their grandmother every year until they were 21. So the question that Dr. Chachanoff asks is, how do you want to be remembered? And there are all kinds of uh, legacy apps and other things that can be used to help with this, or even just having a, a discussion and, and writing things down. More about that later, but that's one of the things. Also the maintenance of pride. So for me, it's one of the reasons why I insist on students and residents calling people uh, you know, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith or whatever, uh, whatever the patient wants, but not just going in there to when you're 25 and saying, hey, Mabel, it's great to see you today. If the person says, oh, please call me, Mabel, that's different. Um, but and being concerned about personal appearance, how do we help people uh, keep up their personal appearance and how they look? Um, what about yourself or your life are you most proud of is one of the the other things uh, that goes deeper than than the surface um i don't know whether any of you have seen the television series called the midwife or not but there's one incredibly poignant scene with a mother who's dying and she was very proper and very upper class and she had a bumbling daughter who was one of the nurses and who never seemed to be able to to um to impress her mother or to get her mother's approval but the the one of the last things that that nurse did for her mother was to paint her fingernails and it was this connection that they had it was just a beautiful time where she under she showed her mother that she understood what was important to her and it was it was a really beautiful connection the the other thing is hopefulness and there's a very cute picture of one of my granddaughters with a very happy picture on her, a very happy grin on her face, and also a picture of tulips coming up through the snow and just being hopeful, reframing hope. Now, BJ Miller, you may know him. He's a, a doctor in San Francisco area. And sadly, he's now speaking for the Dying with Dignity conferences. But he has a TED talk about he he lost uh, several of his limbs in an accident when he was a young person in university and one of the things he says that um, and the question from dr chachanoff is what is still possible one of the things he says that, that we would call reframing hope he says if we love such moments ferociously then maybe we can learn to live well not in spite of death but because of it let death be what takes us not lack of imagination. So I'm sad that he's been co-opted by the dying with dignity, so-called dying with dignity people, but um, I think it's a great 
a great challenge. And I think that's a little bit what Dylan was saying to, to Barbara is let death be what takes you, not lack of imagination of how this could be. Another one is this idea of autonomy or control. And how in control do you feel is the question that's asked. And I would go back to, if you haven't read Viktor Frankl's book called Man's Search for Meaning, uh, Dr. Frankl was a psychiatrist in Austria, a Jewish psychiatrist, and he ended up in a concentration camp, had an opportunity to get out of Austria, but didn't want to leave his parents behind. And his wife and both his parents perished in the concentration camps. But he wrote about that experience and he said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And I think some of the folks who propose euthanasia feel like they're choosing your own way, but that's not what this is saying. This is saying to choose your attitude in the circumstances that you've been given. And uh, I would just add my own beware about this, about being in control because autonomy can lead to disengagement or even abandonment. As Dylan was talking about, the, the atmosphere in the hospitals right now is because when this the law came in, the euthanasia or MAID was written as a right into the Canada Health Act uh, and palliative care was not that people have now this right to made. And so the, the folks who are proposing this and who are in favor of it are really bullying those of us who are not in favor of it. And uh, people are, are afraid not to, uh, to do what really in, in palliative care circles is the standard of care. When somebody says, I wish I were dead, you don't say, okay, we'll call the maid team. You say, what is going on here? Why are you feeling that way? So that if, if you just say, well, it's all about autonomy, that can be disengagement or even abandonment of, of a patient. And it really kind of lets us off the hook. We can say, oh, well, that's what the person really wanted. When underneath, as Ryan Bomberger says, we're not better off dead, we're better off loved. Another one is acceptance. And Frankel also says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think that goes for those of us who are the carers as well as those who are being cared for. And how at peace, here's Dr. Chachanov's question, how at peace are you with what is happening to you? Um, a book that I really found uh, moving is one called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly by Jean-Dominique Bobet. And it's, he, was ended up in locked in syndrome. He's a French gentleman who was the executive editor of a big fashion magazine. And he wrote this book by blinking his eyes, memorizing the, the phrases that he would say, he would write down. His assistant would come and she would point to the letters and he would blink when she got to the letter and he wrote this whole book. So last time when I recommended this book, uh, somebody said, whoo, I watched the movie and it's really steamy. So um, I'm not recommending the movie. I'm just recommending the book. And uh, I found the book really fascinating. And he, he was able to uh, say some really profound things in that book. Um, there's also this idea of resilience or uh, the fighting spirit. And Frankl says, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. So um, what part of you is strongest right now? And this can really be a double-edged sword because if people are, are holding back and saying, well, I'm really strong, and then and all of this stuff about, oh gosh, about how you have to have a positive attitude, you have to be very careful with that. I always, if I see one of those books about positive attitude and healing uh, on a bedside, I always speak about it because and the thing I say is, you know, if you were born 200 years ago, it doesn't matter how positive your attitude it was, you are no longer with us. So we don't want you to be separated from the people you love just because you're going to say, oh, you know, you're giving negative vibes. And the other person is saying, well, I think it's looking worse, but I don't want to be the one with the negative vibes. So 
you have to um, be very careful that the person stays strong in those areas, but doesn't um, become isolated by that. Another one is living in the moment. Are there things that take away, take your mind away from illness and offer you comfort? And some more pictures of my grandchildren on this one, one of them painting, one of them running with their arms outstretched, one of them going through the leaves. Just how are we living in the moment? Can we take our mind away from those things? Another one is maintaining normalcy. So are there things that you still enjoy doing on a regular basis? I remember one patient who said, um, well, I can't play sports anymore, but I really enjoy watching those sports. There's pictures on my PowerPoint of my husband reading to one of our granddaughters and one of our granddaughters reading to herself. And then there's a picture of a very, very, very old teddy bear. And that is Mr. Teddy. And my daughter, Myra, who is in her late 30s, said we could use the picture of Mr. Teddy as long as nobody laughed at Mr. Teddy. And the reason he's on there is when my mother was in her last days and we were staying at the house with her and helping, this was before I was trained in palliative care or anything, she had a look at Mr. Teddy, who was only about two years old at that point. And she said, Mr. Teddy was dirty. So we brought her into the chair where she was sitting. She was on oxygen and everything. But she gave, she and Myra gave Mr. Teddy a bath right on her lap. And then they used a towel and dried him off. And he, he was hung out to dry on the line. But that was something that meant a lot to my mother and to my daughter. It was part of that maintaining normalcy. So are there things that we can do right where the person is that will help to maintain that normalcy? things that you like, you still enjoy doing on a regular basis. Another one is seeking spiritual comfort. So asking, um, is there a religious or spiritual community that you are or would like to be connected with? This is something really, um, really important. And I think um, I remember Dr. DeWeber, he was such a pioneer and such a wonderful man. And this would be something that he would, he would always emphasize as well. And Dr. Saunders did too. That, that this is part of the total pain picture and we, we need to address it. So there is also a social dignity inventory that, that um, Dr. Chachanoff has put together. So there's about 25 questions and they have different domains that they ask questions about. So there are uh, privacy boundaries, social support, the tenor of the care, being a burden to others and aftermath concerns. And underlying themes from this are symptom distress, existential distress, dependency, peace of mind, and social support. Now I know that's, you're never gonna be able to copy all of that down, but I'm gonna give you some examples of this. Um, in, the, in the privacy boundaries, the question would be, what about your privacy or your body is important to you? And, um, I remember the, there's a, a picture on here that's uh, a watercolor that I did over 40 years ago, which was my memory of what it looked like on the November morning when the dawn came up over the rooftops of the houses that I could see outside the window of my hospital room the morning my son was born. And I had a very long 26 hour labor with completely naturally with no meds. And I was completely exhausted at the end of it. And one of the nurses came in and gave me a bath. And of course I was covered with every fluid known to human beings. And um, she gave me a bath, but she did it in such a way that she only uncovered part of me. She did everything very gently and soothingly. And I lay there and just wept because of how cared for I felt. So what, what can we do um, about that? What are the privacy boundaries? Let's find out uh, for our patients. Um, Dr. Chachanov talks about a patient who uh, said, uh, well, I'll tell you that later because it comes up with another question. Um, what, who are the people who are most important to you? Your social support, who is your closest confidant? Um, and boy, I'll tell you, this has been so hard in COVID and with all the restrictions that people have not had the social support. And it's been hard, not only for the patients and the caregivers, but for those of us who are trying to care for them, because we know how great it could be, but we couldn't, we, we couldn't meet those needs because of the restrictions. Also the care tenor. 
And is there anything in the way that you're treated that's undermining your sense of dignity? And I would just say to you, think about the tragedy and disgrace of long-term care facilities versus pediatric facilities. You know, there's a lot of patients in pediatric facility who are incontinent and that um, who are not very good at controlling their bodily fluids, but pediatric floors don't smell like urine and feces. And the, the colors on the walls are bright and happy and the, the little sinks and the toilets and the chairs are adapted for the use of those children. And I think it's a complete tragedy and disgrace that those who have served us for the rest of their lives before that are treated so poorly compared to how we treat our children. And even, even how we're treating our children isn't all that great, but uh, someone once said to me, oh, Dr. Cottle, don't be so sure you don't wanna have, you don't want made to be legalized until you've spent some time in a nursing home. You might want it yourself someday. And I, I think that's just obscene. So what about being a burden to others? Do you worry about being a burden to others? And if so, in what ways are you worried about this? Now, um, I try not to use the word burden. It happens to be in Dr. Chachanov's thing, so I left it there. But I try to use the word stress or challenge or things like that, because patients are already thinking that they're a burden. But uh, sometimes, sometimes there, if the shoe's on the other foot, one of the patients that I took care of in, in Nova Scotia at one point said to me, um, his family would come in and they'd be cheerful with him. And then they'd go down to the family room and they would all cry and wail. And then they'd come back and be cheerful. And he looked at me and he said, don't they know I'm dying? And I said, yes, they understand that. And he says, aren't they going to miss me? And so I went down to the family room and I said, you know, your dad's back there. And he, he asked me these two questions. Oh, you know, and they started wailing and you could hear them running all the way down the hall. Oh, dad, we're going to miss you. It's terrible. And, you know, that, that gentleman needed to know that he was, he was loved like that. Another one is what are your biggest, biggest concerns for the people you will leave behind? When I did my training in Montreal, we had a lady who was, English was not her first language and the home country, we had a horrible time getting her pain under control until we figured out that she had a disabled son at home. And in her home country, this was considered to be a shameful thing. And she was so concerned about how he was going to be cared for after she died. Well, we got him into a group home and he was very happy in the group home. And we were able to get her pain under control with less medication as well. So what are your concerns for those you'll leave behind? So also there are internal and external aspects in how we experience dignity. And they're both, they're dependent upon both the strength of ourself and on our environment. So um, one of the things that Dr. Chachanov talks about is that care team members provide, an, that's all of us, provide a mirror to our patients. So how the patients perceive themselves to be seen is a powerful mediator of their dignity. So if they perceive themselves to be seen as someone worthy of dignity, then they experience that feeling of being dignified. I know it's a little complicated, but if you think about it, you'll get it. So the experience of dignity is like a dance. The intimate connection, this is what Dr. Chachanov says, the intimate connection between the care team member's affirmation and the patient self-perception underscores the basis of dignity conserving care. So we're always kind of going back and forth, um, reinforcing the positive things, trying to mitigate the negative things so that people will have that experience of that. Um, he's also written a very interesting article called the ABCD of Dignity Conserving Care. And the, the aspects of that he talks about are attitude, behavior, compassion, and dialogue. So I've given some examples of those things um, and under behavior, one of the things he says is that uh, it must be predicated on kindness and respect. Small acts of kindness can personalize care and often take little time to perform. Just like that nurse giving me a bath. 
And so respecting someone's privacy, sitting down when you go to visit somebody. They did a study that showed that doctors got credit, credit for being there twice as long if they just sat down. So giving the full attention to the patient, using appropriate language, giving the gift of time, that's one of the behaviors behind dignity conserving care. And then the compassion, the C for it is a deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. And then the last one is dialogue, which means that um, acknowledging the personhood beyond the illness and recognizing the emotional impact that accompanies the illness. Um, back in 1927, a doctor named Francis Peabody gave a lecture that was published later in the journal of the American Medical Association almost 100 years ago. Very little is left in medicine that's still relevant, but his lecture is. And what he said was the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. We're better off loved, basically, is what he's saying. Now, one of my questions that I find is a completely excellent question that um, you can ask uh, is, what's the worst part of this for you? And I have gotten some absolutely stunning answers to this. Well, the worst part of this is that I have a, a brother in New Brunswick that I haven't spoken to for, for 30 years and I, I, I really wanna know where he is and I wanna be reconciled. Or I had a child I gave up for adoption 40 years ago when I was 15. So some of these things, or you know, I really don't wanna miss the big game. <laughs> you know, some of these things that are there, it's not always what we expect it to be. So I find that a really good question. What's the worst, what is the worst part of this for you? So. Dignity therapy, I know we're coming to the end here, but dignity therapy is a, a subset of dignity conserving care. It was developed by um, Dr. Chachanoff and his team. And I'll just give you the, their little summary of what it is because um, I just, I felt so honored to be trained how to do this. So he says, dignity therapy is a psychological intervention designed specifically to address many of the psychological, existential, and spiritual challenges that patients and their families face as they grapple with the reality of life drawing to a close. And it offers a way to preserve meaning and hope for patients approaching death. And the, what, here's one of the things he says in his book about it. The rationale for many palliative care interventions is to make the patient less aware of his or her suffering. Although analgesia, that's pain control, does not eliminate the source of physical pain, it nevertheless effectively eliminates the sensation of pain. Dignity therapy, however, attempts to deal with emotional pain by targeting its source. So uh, it's, it's a little bit complicated. You, you ask some questions, you write it up and you read it to the patient and they can do that. But there's some really good questions. And after I gave this longer version of this talk um, to Phys Canadian Physicians for Life in October, I had a, a, an email from a resident who had been doing this palliative care rotation. And he said, you know, those questions that you had I asked a patient some of those questions and the person changed his mind from wanting to have, uh, to have made, from wanting euthanasia to wanting to go to hospice. And the staff person I was working with, couldn't believe it, went back in and asked him and sure enough, he had changed his mind. So think about some of these questions um, or, or statements. So please tell me a little bit about yourself. What has been your greatest joy or accomplishment? When did you feel most alive? What are, your most, what are the most important roles you have played? Are there things you would want your family to know or remember about you? What are your hopes and dreams for your loved ones? Is there anything you feel you still need to do or say? And they don't, they don't put in the document that they make anything that's like a negative bombshell. It has to be positive. If the person wants to say that to their loved ones, they have said, you know, go ahead, but we're not going to be party to something like that. Um, are, what are your, um, in creating this permanent record, are there other things that you would like to have included? So it was interesting that in the work that 
Dr. Chachanoff and also, also Dr. Bill Breitbart in, at Sloan Kettering in New York did, they found that it was really hard to actually get a control group when they were doing these things because just asking these questions gave people um, a, a lighter heart and uh, more of a desire to live. So that's quite interesting. The other thing that Dr. Chachanoff and his team came up with is the dignity question. And this is something that any doctor can do or any therapist or actually any relative, any lawyer. What do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? And he gave the example of this question being used with, he works in Winnipeg, Dr. Chachanoff does, and he, they asked this woman and she, she said, well, I guess it would be important for you to know that I'm a residential school survivor and that any symbols of authority like white coats are very scary to me and that I'm terrified if someone enters my room without knocking. So Dr. Chachanoff says, do you think it made a difference as to how we cared for her when we knew those things? Of course it did. And so what they do is they ask this question, they write up a summary of it, they show it to the patient, get it corrected, and then they say, would you like this to be part of your chart? And almost everybody says yes. So that's the dignity question. Now, coming back to this, this whole idea of um, uh, you know, practicing dignity, conserving care, et cetera. So whose responsibility is it if our patients are feeling a loss of dignity or are the, those people around us? I, I propose that it's actually our responsibility as a society to, to provide the, the kind of environment that will help the person to realize that he is he or she is loved. Now, coming back to this idea of, of MAID or euthanasia or assisted suicide, I decided I was going to start putting this in really stark words. And so stating it starkly without the euphemisms that people in the press and other places use, what do you have to believe to support made euthanasia assisted suicide. What do you have to believe? So here's the three things that you have to believe and feel free to use this. One, you have to believe that it can be a societal good to have a legal framework to kill another member of the human family outside the context of self-defense. To have a legal framework to kill another member of the human family, that that can be something that's a good in society. Otherwise we wouldn't approve it. Two, you have to believe that some lives are not worth living. And if you're gonna regulate it, it's not the person, but others decide which lives those are. So that doesn't sound completely autonomous. And three, you have to believe that at least in some cases, killing is preferable to caring. So those three things. Uh, and if you take away all the other trappings of autonomy and what people want, you, you actually have to believe those things um, in order to support it. So what do you think is more honored in Canada, rights or love? <laughs> uh, that's, there's, that's a path. Um, in fact, I, I once spoke with an, another colleague who said, rights are an admission that love has failed. So if everybody looks out for the rights of everybody else, we don't, need to, we don't need to have rights, that's love. But rights are an admission that love has failed. Now, you know, we need rights because just like Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others, that we do need to have rights because we live in, a, in an imperfect society. But is that, the, is that the pinnacle of what we really want? Um, what kind of a world and in what story do we want to live? What kind of a story in a world do we want to leave for our children and our grandchildren? Um, Sheila Cassidy, who I think is retired now, a, a palliative care physician in the UK, wrote um, a, a beautiful uh, book called Sharing the Darkness that people from every kind of faith and no kind of faith have, uh, have really enjoyed. My Buddhist friend loved it. Um, and she has a chapter called The Stabat Mater, which um, Dr. Cassidy is Catholic and she, there's a mass about Mary standing, the mother standing at the foot of the cross. And so she likens the fact that when we are bearing witness, it's a bit like that, like Mary standing at the foot of the cross when she could technically do nothing. And so this is what um, Dr. Dr. Cassidy writes. 
Slowly, as the years go by, I learn about the importance of powerlessness. I experience it in my own life, and I live, it with, live with it in my work. The secret is not to be afraid of it, not to run away. The dying know we are not God. All they ask is that we do not desert them. That we stand our ground at the foot of the cross. At this stage of the journey of being there, of simply being, it is, in many ways, the hardest part. Standing there and bearing witness that this person is better off loved. So um, my conclusion is that in practicing dignity conserving care, and every one of you can do this, for our patients and their loved ones, for our colleagues, for the profession of medicine itself and for our communities. So this provides both the challenge and the opportunity to be true healers and to stay more integrated ourselves, not despite our contact with other members of the human family who are suffering, but indeed because of that privilege and gift. Um, and I do have a slide that has my email address on it. Um, I'll try to put it in the chat so that if you want to contact me, you can. Um, and I apologize for the technical stuff. This is the worst I've ever had it. But anyway, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you got it's it's a uh, one one time we were at a, a at a thing that the, the the slides didn't come up on the thing and he just held up the little slide, the little tiny old slide and said, you can see here. That's kind of like I feel what I was doing tonight. But um, I hope that I will send this PowerPoint, I'll send the, the longer version of it um, to Zoe and we'll, um, uh, we'll, you, can, you can write to her and get, get a copy of it. Oh dear, so sorry.